Hey, everybody. Um, just a quick intro for myself. Uh, my name is Nathan Siegel. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager at MinOS. Uh, as today's moderator, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our viewers and our two guests here. And just before we begin, um, I'd just like to say a little bit about how we like to uh, conduct our webinars here. Um, I think that it will be much more helpful for everyone if we do this as a dialogue and less as a, um, an educational um, lecture. Um, so really what I want is for anyone who has a question, anyone who has an anecdote, please share in the chat at any time and just pipe up with whatever you have. We'll take your questions as they come. And we'll also leave some time at the at the end of the presentation to ensure that everything is addressed and that everyone you know leaves as informed as possible. Uh, looks like we've got a really great turnout today. So um, I'm eager to jump right in. I'm sure you guys are too. So um, let's get started. Sorry. So for today's agenda, uh, we'll do an introduction to Gal and Juta, and then we'll begin by covering the new role that data governance professionals have in the era in this era of AI. The new European Act that made it a reality, and some of the specifics that businesses are dealing with in the wake of these new trends. So if you don't already know, we are MinOS and we serve amazing customers around the world. You can see some of them here. Um, and we are also very lucky to have many, many accolades um, on G2. We are far and away one of the most popular uh, data privacy and governance platforms in the world. And very happy to be here and to share some of our expertise with you. Um, our esteemed guest speaker today is Juta Williams. She is the Senior Director of Security, Privacy, and Compliance Engineering at Reddit, which we are all probably very familiar with, or we should be. Juta is also a co-founder of Humane Intelligence, which is a nonprofit that specializes in ethical and safe creation of generative AI products. And last but not least, she is a member of Minds Advisory Board. Um, our own in-house uh, speaker here is uh, Gal Golan, who we affectionately refer to as Galgo. And he is the co-founder and CTO of Mine, and uh, an expert and veteran in the engineering that goes into data privacy and governance operations. He has a ton of experience at using and developing AI and is very, very passionate about these ideas. So we're very lucky to be able to absorb some of his insights today. Um, now, so let's kick it off. Um, the first part of the webinar, I would like to hand the mic to Juta. So Juta, take it away. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Nathan, and uh, welcome to all of you out there. I am very curious what percentage of folks here are, are coming at this from a privacy lens and how many of you are coming at it from an ML lens. Um, I can tell you that I, I actually think these are all three uh, kind of evolutions within data protection that that have a lot of alignment. Um, my personal career kind of chased the security engineering to privacy engineering to ML and, and kind of responsible ethics uh, point of view. Uh, and I think that they're very closely related. Um, when we started uh, in technology back before the turn of the century, as the kids like to say, uh, we were really worried mostly about external threats to an infrastructure that was a, was a kind of a crisis, like a little perimeter defense with a bunch of soft, chewy information on the inside. And we were mostly work, working to, to keep bad guys out. 
And then over the course of time, as technology evolved and, and kind of use cases changed, we started to look a lot more inward at the appropriate use cases for data, how it was being used, whether or not people were being afforded what emerged as rights. And, and that became kind of the privacy engineering uh, flex. And I'd say that over the course of time, as, as more technical solutions come into play, and as we understand this landscape and how to protect people better, I think that the long-term consequences of using data at scale is kind of what drives a lot of the AI ethics conversation today, and is also driving a little bit of the, of the new risk frameworks that are emerging in regulation. So I'm excited to talk a little bit about how these three, three things are, are very closely interconnected, how they're kind of uh, evolutions of one another, how all three persist and will sustain over the course of time. And also it helps for me at least answer the question of why me? Why me? Why am I the one that gets tapped by new regulatory authorities and also leadership for implementing some of these AI governance tactics and tools? Um, and largely it's because we've been doing it for security and then privacy and then now for this new field in, in science of AI ethics. Um, we, we have the same obligations. And as IAPP put it rather, I think, well, they said, you know, explainability, fairness and accountability are really core to the privacy mission. And um, it really is just an extension of what is already a governance structure that seems to be evolving into a working model for managing data risk inside of a business. Now, I jokingly over uh, simplify AI as big data with statistics on top. And so for me, um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of corollary between the practices that we engaged in first, first from security to safeguard data um, and then into privacy for ensuring we're using it for appropriate things um, and expanding it into AI governance. So my hope is that um, as we explore kind of this new regulatory advancement that is um, that uh, that is causing a lot of concern in industry and also um, being tapping uh, people who are in a data governance or a privacy uh, role to do new things that you'll see that it's not a huge expansion, um, that a lot of the things we do today are things that we can continue to do um, to uh, ensure that responsible innovation can, uh, is applied throughout the evolution of this new technical space. All right, so I'm going to pause there. We're getting some great conversation in the chat, which I'm so grateful for. It helps me know if people are actually enjoying the conversation or not. I'm pretty excited about um, all the information governance folks, the people who have security and privacy in their background. Um, uh, I'm pretty excited to see all of you kind of embracing this new functional role that a lot of companies are thrusting on us to, uh, to take on AI governance as well. So with that, maybe we move to the next slide, Nathan, and we chat a little bit about uh, what this act actually is. So I've linked uh, uh, at the bottom uh, uh, what I think is a really great blog from a company that I really like. Uh, LaCare, I wanna give them a little bit of props, um, is a company that's really focused on education in the area of prompt engineering um, and security for AI. Uh, and I really like their kind of nutshell here around uh, what is included in the act. And for the most part, it's another risk-based approach to classifying systems, in this case, AI, um, categorizing based on risk and then giving corresponding management responsibilities. It's a lot like a lot of the other privacy regulations that we've employed um, um, over the last couple of years or deployed, I should say. And um, it gives us a, a little bit of new insight into what are some high risk and, and maybe even prohibited activities with, with uh, regard to AI. Um, I think that it's a point of view. I think it's an important point of view. I think that it's gonna challenge a lot of practices around the world. And I think it's a great conversation starter. Um, what I would say though, is if we go to the next slide, is that it isn't a very substantially um, impactful uh, regulation for most people who use AI. Now, that's not to say that there aren't folks on this call who deal with really tough um, uh, ML applications in, in, the, in the space of justice, immigration, law, um, even in education and, and employment. Uh, but I would say that a, a vast majority of people who are using ML um, in its nascent stage today are probably looking at the limited risk or even minimal risk kind of categorizations. So I wanna talk a little bit about what conformity assessments are and, and what some of these prohibited tasks are um, that the EU thinks are, are not appropriate uh, for automated decision systems, including AI. But I also wanna really focus on what are the practical things that we get to do? Because I should have said this at the beginning, I am not a lawyer. I'm not going to be giving any legal advice. I'm an engineer, I'm an operations person. So I'm focused a lot on what can I do today to make sure that I'm prepared for a future. Um, I'm not here to give legal advice and also I represent my own interests, uh, my, own, my own ideas, not necessarily those of my employers, past or present. Um, so that being said, Let's talk a little bit about what the different categorizations are 
And uh, I think for the first time, we, we, we saw codified in rule that there are some applications of AI that are just not appropriate. So social scoring was highlighted, which is controversial. Um, also, some of the facial recognition applications um, that were very specifically identified, and also some of the emotional manipulation use cases that emerged as part of early research into applied ML, especially on social platforms, were identified as just not being appropriate. I think it's also super fascinating, <laughs> as, as Estelle said, and it's great to see you, Estelle, by the way, um, is that we do have uh, an, an important accountability for us to do assessments and really understand the impact on people for what are called high risk uh, applications of ML. And this includes things like from an educational standpoint, making determinations about who gets to be admitted to a university or from an employment perspective, who makes it through a filtering process and is offered an opportunity to interview for a job. Of course, in the justice space, uh, dark pattern AI, right? So Tyler, um, dark pattern AI is an interesting one. Uh, when you start to uh, build um, AI solutions that prompt a person to make choices that would best benefit a business, um, that might be considered a dark pattern to AI um, application. D dark pattern inside of the privacy space would include things like misleading consent forms or consent um, uh, forms that would uh, kind of prompt somebody to say yes when and, and make it very difficult to say no. Um, so when AI is kind of prompting you toward a decision that would lend itself to kind of a manipulative business practice or to, to, to acquiesce to something that they maybe wouldn't normally acquiesce to, that would be considered a dark pattern. If that makes sense. I, and there, I, I'll happily follow up as well with some more detail. Uh, so it's kind of like looking at the ways that we manipulate people for addictive reasons, oh. for manipulative reasons, all of those um, are kind of considered out of scope. I can give you a, a for instance, when, when I worked at, um, at Twitter, we were very, pu we published a paper and, and we even ran a bias bounty around this idea of an image cropping algorithm that was used um, based on a saliency algorithm. So saliency is, is basically tracking eye movement and finding out what a person might find interesting in a picture and then using that point as a reference to, to do something. In our case, we used it to crop an image so that we could save real estate on our landing page. Well, that's an that's a trained model that doesn't um, rely on conscious decision making by a human being. It was just kind of an unconscious tracking of eye movement. And unfortunately, it was trained in such a way, it was trained mostly on college campuses by, by people um, uh, between a certain age group and of a specific gender. And it resulted in um, an unintended consequence of cropping women from neck to navel, because that was the most interesting part of a picture for that particular um, group of people. So trying to identify what might be an inappropriate or not necessary use of ML is a really big part of the impact assessment that they ask us to perform as part of the conformity assessment process. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a assessment kind of set of criteria. And again, it's applied to this kind of high risk category of use cases. Um, most ML use cases that I see fall into this limited risk uh, category, and they've really tried to um, balance innovation and impact um, and, and the ability for people to understand kind of the, the world that's affecting them by only asking for a transparency notice. Well, in addition to some other ethics and, and other code of conduct related things. But for the most part, for users, they want people to know when they're interacting with one of these um, limited risk bots. These are chat bots. These are recommender systems. These are um, technologies that look and, and categorize um, uh, uh, images on, on the internet and label them. They want you to know that you're interacting with an AI when you're when you're participating in a, in a decision, especially about yourself, that is uh, depending on an AI uh, or an algorithm whether it's ML or something else. Limited risk uh, uh, and transparency seemed like an appropriate balance between innovation and, and protection. And then at the bottom of the stack here are really common uses of AI, including spam filters. Oh, Sorry, my, my Alexa wanted to chime in. Um, video games, um, places where AI is used really, really routinely. And what they wanna know is that the company has a position and that you have a position on what is the code of conduct when you're applying ML in those use cases. So kind of a, a stratified impact on people using ML for its first iteration um, based on risk to the person and, and, and harms that might be uh, committed or, or inadvertently or inadvertently through the application of ML. Um, I would highlight for everybody here that education and employment are an interesting category. Um, education and employment uh, arguably could apply to internal practices, making determinations about whether or not you're going to send somebody uh, to uh, an educational program, or perhaps they're 
making some decisions about um, employment uh, and, 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 and promotability or things like that. So if you're using technologies that you're not certain employ AI or that may be using AI um, and you're not 100% certain, um, taking a look at your employment um, applications that, that have AI uh, features enabled, making sure that um, you're looking at it from a non-discriminatory practice. Uh, and if, if, if it goes beyond just kind of monitoring um, and evaluating worker kind of practices, uh, which would fall into that limited risk category, um, ensuring that you've maybe completed the conformity assessment and you're looking at things like bias. Unacceptable risk, yeah, um, Yuying, uh, really good question. So, uh, you know, this comes down to almost a, uh, an, a, an ethical position that is very, uh, almost, it's very polarizing, right? So a lot of folks in the West don't consider a social scoring system to be a, uh, an acceptable practice. But I know that in, in, in other countries, it's, it's a very normal practice. So for the EU, they determined that that was when relying on ML specifically to analyze data and assign that score to a human being, that they didn't feel like that was an appropriate ap application of, of, of uh, at-scale decision-making. Part of it is social, and part of that is just the reliance on on a computer system to make that determination without the intervention of a human being in, in understanding of the human experience. I hope that's helpful. Philosophies differ around the world. One of the one of my uh, embarrassingly I don't even know how that happened um, accomplishments in life was to be the inaugural chair to the to ISO from the U.S. for AI standards. And our first plenary session was in Beijing. And, uh, you know, just kind of experiencing the international point of view on AI and, and how we could form standards that would be interoperable around the world was just a very eye-opening experience for me because the, the positions are very different country by country, um, Europe to US to South America to Scandinavia, um, certainly out um, in, in APAC. Mm -hmm. Trying to, to, to build for a, a global economy or a global uh, infrastructure can be quite challenging to make sure everybody um, gets what they need. Maybe we can move to the next slide since we're already past my allotted time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say that uh, if, if you are a privacy professional, um, this new rule kind of adds to, rather than um, this is completely uh, different from a lot of the work we do with privacy impact assessments. So I'd say that the step through process is not terribly different. Um, if you've if you if you've actually assessed um, any of your AI use cases using a privacy impact assessment or had to write a, a, a DPI uh, for any of these applications, the process isn't terribly different. There's different questions to ask about impacts and harms and kind of consequences for human beings in the use of uh, these sorts of technologies. But I'd say that the um, the conformity assessment is not. Um, expansively different um, in its nature from from a lot of the the DPIA questions. Registration is is new, and certainly a declaration of conformity is a little bit new. The attestation component, but the actual internal practice of assessing for impact and harms not terribly different. So, if I might go to the next one, Nathan, I would suggest that as practitioners, there's probably quite a bit that you're already doing to get ready in advance of any kind of like long-term or, or, or broadening of this particular act. So you have the potential for global adoption, you have the potential for cross-border data transfers. I know some companies are making um, new plans or considerations for where ML is or maybe trained for their businesses based on some of these rules and these changes. And then of course, um, there's a lot of uh, consideration around data sharing and reuse of, of information that, um, that you might be sharing with your SaaS vendors or other other suppliers uh, that are, would be used for AI development. So to, to kind of get ahead of this uh, kind of trend, whether the EU Act applies to you very directly in any kind of substantial way or not, I would suggest the following, and maybe we can go to the last slide of my section, which is this, uh, that there are some practical things you can do to enhance already existing practices uh, that would help you uh, align with a future global kind of AI governance uh, expectation and or just prepare you for, for, for becoming in scope for some of these EU Act uh, obligations. For me, I, I, I thought that a good place to start would be to look at your legal contracts and make sure that all the companies that you're doing business with, and a lot of them are, are, are sending AI addendums um, and all kinds of additional DSA related um, allowances for them to be able to leverage and use data to improve products and services specifically with AI in mind. Um, take a look and see if there are some limitations you want to attach to those addendums. 
Uh, maybe you want to specify that you can't use it for any of those prohibited uses or for any of those high risk uses. Maybe there's an opportunity uh, to enhance your privacy review process to ask just a couple of questions from the conformity assessment, especially if AI is, in, is embedded in those products and services, uh, just to keep ahead of some of the questions that you might have to ask in the future. Um, also, if you're doing a lot of development for your own company, if you're an engineering company like I've supported the last couple jobs, um, new product design launches um, might be using new ML uh, practices, making sure that you're asking the right conformity assessment related questions to identify what risk level um, these ML um, ap applications represent, and then making sure that you're capturing the documentation necessary. If you have an ML shop and you're building a lot of machine learning, they probably already have what are called model cards. This is kind of a, a provenance documentation tool that is fairly common in ML. Uh, practitioner world, uh, maybe adding a couple of questions from the conformity assessment to those existing or new model card um, submissions to collect information about risk categories and, and how you've assessed those models to be in one of these four categories of risk um, and, and applied some of the handling requirements that we talked about, like transparency. And lastly, you might update some of your existing administrative collateral in advance of these rules applying to you or because these rules apply to you. Internal policies that define some of these acceptable use cases for your business. Maybe you want to be very, very um, proactive and describe um, what will never be acceptable for your business, what risks are intolerable. Maybe you want to define that high risk related ML applications for things like critical infrastructure, education, employment, um, public services, law enforcement, et cetera are not to be explored in your business and that that's a prohibition that you can rely on when people come to you with new technology and tools. Or maybe you want to explain that if they do that, then there's a new procedure or process for review. Um, and then also, you know, you might want to take a look and write <laughs> a code of conduct for how ML and AI applications uh, will be used in your business. Um, this is the bottom tier of risk. It's the minimal risk for uses of a very common ML use cases like assistance and, and spam filters and things like that, where you just want to make sure that you have a very good uh, understanding for your workforce what are best practices in the AI, in the AI application space and, and data ethics? Um, and that would be your, your kind of defense that you're they're taking appropriate precautions. Um, embedding in your education can even be in your privacy and security education, if you wish. Um, there are lots of sources from which to choose some of these uh, ethical positions. <laughs> in fact, this sources uh, link that we'll send out um, has over 233 that you can choose from. Uh, and all of them are really great ethical positions on the application of innovation, AI, and, and data um, in your in your kind of uh, data ethics uh, kind of position for your business. So please, uh, these are a couple of things you can do today. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to pass over to Gal. Uh, we want to make sure we save time for questions. It looks like Paula. Um, to own data governance? I do. I do believe that the who better, I guess, would be the question I'd ask for your business. Governance programs are expensive. They're expensive from a time perspective, from a staffing perspective, and also from a training, education, and awareness standpoint. So if, if you need to tack on additional governance, my feeling is that it's best uh, supporting an organization when, it, when it's the same governance structure that already supports um, data protection generally. Uh, it, it reduces cost and it reduces the likelihood of, of folks not knowing where to go for help. Uh, so I do think that it should be part of the same organization. I do think that there's, um, you need to it, you know, up your game a little bit on the technical side in order for you to have real, uh, really good conversations with technologists, but that's been kind of the, the story for data protection for a long time. If, I've never, I don't know of any other career fields where you have to stay on top of new technology and innovation and, and education as much as in this field. So I think this is yet another uh, evolution in, in what we're expected to understand and be able to uh, advise on. Uh, John's writing, but I wanted to um, pass the baton to Gal to kind of give some some insights into some ways that technology can help with some of these these activities. Thanks, Juta. So right. we can go to the next slide. And uh, I want to start by um, sharing why I think this uh, new wave of AI governance is special. So I, I've selected some of uh, like the main three shifts or activities around AI governance and uh, why I think they are so special. And, and the key around everything is very tight collaboration with data science teams. So just as Juta said, 
uh, like we've, we're we already used to privacy and data protection teams having very close collaborations uh, with engineering and technical teams and having a very deep technical understanding in order to do jo the job properly. Uh, but now we're seeing even a requirement for even tighter collaboration with data science teams and researchers. Um, I feel like the the kind of left behind were with all the GDPR wave and the new privacy protection laws, but uh, now that's going to stop and they will have to start speaking much more often with uh, privacy and data protection teams. And just as Juta joked that um, AI is uh, statistics on big data, I often joke that AI is just large scale statistics, but large statistics is hard as it is and large scale statistics just makes it a black box that no one really understands. So I think again, to everyone has to up their games into really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. And I think that applies into all three processes listed here. So we will see increased focus on ethical AI. I think the best thing you can do as a data protection um, team to with the data science team is to collaborate from the start and come up with clear um, guidelines or set of rules on what's right and what's wrong. It, you can apply to um, handling data, like data collection and training sets, uh, what data is allowed to be collected, how it should be stored and tagged, who can access it. Maybe you should even use synthetical data, um, how the model is deployed, how the outputs from the models are being used, how we communicate what's going on to our users, what types of, what choices do we give them? So I think it's collaborating and establishing those early on uh, when we, for example, plan new projects um, is very important because those things tend to have a very deep impact um, into how these projects get, get executed. Uh, they define constraints that you, the team really wants to understand early on and to uh, feel the boundaries in which they can operate. So again, having those discussions with the technical teams early on is, I think, key to, to success. Then we have uh, government governance policies. So I think it's very similar to how uh, back in the days, security teams started collaborating with engineering teams to make sure the security risks, risks are mitigated uh, through the software development lifecycle. So I think it's the same here. Imagine data protection teams or AI governance teams collaborating with data scientists to make sure any risks are mitigated throughout the development, deployment, or use of an AI system uh, inside our products. Um, so again, that close collaboration, uh, I think, is going to be key for success in those dialogues. Then we have risk assessments. So uh, again, for data protection teams to be able to do those risk assessments, they have to understand the algorithms, how they are evaluated, um, how they treat data, how they can uh, be toggled on or off. Maybe we can offer alternatives that are not based on MLs. Um, and, you know, different organizations will have different uh, risks. Some will have um, trust and safety as the top of minds. Uh, some will have privacy concerns and um, some will have uh, business resiliency risks. So the risks are very different. You have to pick your own risks, communicate that uh, with the data science teams and make sure uh, they provide you with the right information so you can assess those risks and mitigate them. Um, and in order to do all of that, I think the collaboration starts by cataloging AI-related assets. And let's start by first like describing two, two different uh, use cases. So on the left side, you can be a developer of uh, AI systems. And on the right side, you can simply be a user of AI systems. The fact that you are a user and not a developer doesn't make things simpler, that I'll tell you that. And you can be anywhere in between. Uh, now, obviously, you're not just in one place. You will have many different use cases in the company, and each one will be located somewhere else on the scale. But it's important to map out all the different use cases. So let's let's review a few examples. 
So customer support bots, uh, that's a very popular example of like, let's say a customer support tool that internally uses AI or Gen AI to provide you and your customers with the best service. And you might not even know that your one of your vendors is using AI internally. Uh, so it's kind of like indirect use of AI. You're obviously a user. And in those cases, your assessments will mostly focus on how the third party, in this case, the vendor, is handling the AI machine. Um, you will have marketing assets, generators like content creators, um, image creators. Again, you're using a machine. Here it's a bit more obvious because custom, people usually look for these things specifically. They want to use AI to generate content. But again, most of the assessment is going to focus on the third party. Here you might be, you might have some other risks uh, related to copyrights because you are directly handling the output from the model and you are handling the assets and, and they are used by your organization. So I shifted it a bit to the left. Then we have open AI APIs. Um, this is again shifted more to the left because there's no specific use case here. And, and we see more and more people throughout organizations create, for example, automations that use those APIs to for many different use cases. So again, it's not really clear. You would assess the OpenAI API for how they handle your data, but you will have to focus some part of the assessment on what you do with it. So again, shift it to the left a bit more. Then we have like um, infrastructure services like Amazon Bedrock and Azure AI bots. Those are just two examples, but we have many more. Those are services that allow you to host custom modules or build custom AI workflows. The vendor is going to be responsible for making sure your product is secure, uh, maybe help you with change management. But to be honest, most of the responsibility is on you, the builder. So now we're going to the left side, the developer. And then we have homebrew AI models that you build inside the company. Obviously, here you are responsible for everything. You will focus the assessments on, again, how we collect the data, how we store it, how we tag it, how we treat it, how we build the model, change management, how we evaluate it, uh, how it's used in the product, and what we communicate to our users. So on the left side, developers, the entire assessment, or almost the entire assessment, is going to be focused on how I, as a company, uh, do those processes. Uh, next slide. Uh, I see we skipped one slide. Nathan, is it possible to try to figure out where the slide is? If not, we can skip it. Um, I think, let's see. I think it's just not listed as visible. Yeah. Um, you know what, I think we are running a bit short on time, if it's all right with you. Can okay. We... okay, okay, we can skip it. So right. um, just to give you uh, like a quick uh, sneak peek on what's coming up in MineOS and as a direct uh, uh, segue to this conversation, we have built a new module in MineOS that helps you do exactly that. Search your organization and discover AI assets. Um, so, for example, AI assets that will help you figure out what use cases you have in the company and for which type of use case they relate to, like developer, user, or deployer. So let's, let's see a few examples. We have stakeholders. You know, that's the most obvious one. Stakeholders can be data scientists. They can be researchers, the ones building AI modules. They can also be uh, users of systems such as uh, customer support chatbots or marketing asset generators and stuff like that. So MineOS helps you do both. It plugs into your directory and brings you all the data scientists, researchers, and users of AI systems. Another type of assets is training sets. So if you use data classification, it automatically detects training sets, how they are used, where they are stored, who owns them, what types of data they store, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like a sneak peek. I don't want to turn this into a, a sales pitch, but we kind of like get, gather everything uh, into one place to 
streamline the beginning of this process. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that we we do have a little bit of extra time here. Uh, maybe, maybe I have a I have a thought and an idea to to sport. Maybe maybe it's appropriate. Maybe <laughs> maybe it's yeah, deeper. Please, please share. But, you know, I, I've been kind of in this like security privacy ML space for a long time, and risk management is a is a fairly well constructed process. It's like a five step, seven step process, depending on which school of thought you belong to. And you know, AI and ML risks are managed pretty much similarly. It always starts with a uh, you know, the same step, it's inventory. <laughs> I, uh, you know, but finding all the ways that ML is leaked into organizations is actually really tough. Um, you know, a lot of technologies that have been deployed for a long time have suddenly started sprouting AI features that get enabled, um, or uh, their plugins that people drop into their Chrome browsers, or uh, there's just a lot of ways that AI is kind of like feeding into our business um, in ways that are really uh, hard to track, monitor, and and and, and assess. Gal, one of the reasons I thought that this was a really cool feature extension for 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 mine is that you know we're already doing a bit of investigation into kind of rogue apps, the ability to find tech that's, that's landed in our environment that maybe we didn't expect. Um, and so, you know, how does how does this kind of play into the AI inventory risk assessment first step? So uh, yeah, I think the it's it's exactly that approach of hel um, having a shortcut uh, and surfacing all the hints in the organization for AI assets and their use cases. So we gather them in use cases, and uh, the flow here guides you to package uh, the assets into a specific use case, and then helps you do the assessment. So. It really saves you that legwork of uh, going and asking people, of you know, finding the right people, or pulling in different information from different uh, corners of the organization. So it kind of puts everything in one place and then walks you through the steps of uh, from an asset that was discovered all the way to an assessment for a specific use case. So that's where we save some time. I think it's a it's it's a it's a really exciting thing. I'm kind of curious for folks on the call who are who are in the chat, you know, how how confident are you that you understand how ML has already entered your space and and how your data might be being leveraged to to train some of your third party app products? Um, that's my greatest fear in life, to be honest, <laughs> is that somebody turned on a feature and all of a sudden. And, and and accepted uh, the uh, AI addendum that allows them to to actively train on my data. Kind of curious if that's a common fear. Yeah, well, I know I can tell you that uh, working at MineOS, one of our one of our biggest concerns is shadow IT, right, Galgo? Yeah, I think actually. Um... One of my biggest concerns uh, as the CTO is, I, I'm, I don't know if that's a term, but shadow AI. So I think mm -hmm. it's obvious to be accountable for the AI that ends up in the product and touches customer data. You know, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's kind of obvious that everyone's focused around it. But when you think about it, there's a whole research department out there doing their day-to-day, -day, coming up with stuff, different initiatives, POCs that don't end up in production. I, and I think that's, that's, those are the risky areas because that's where mistakes can happen. That's the area that's kind of left or could be left unattended. So I think that's what I call shadow AI. Uh, and, and that's why I think having an automated monitoring or discovery tool solves that for me. Uh, because I, you know, obviously I don't want to speak with them every day and ask them what they're doing and what's that file and what's that data set. That's not what we have going on here. But I have, you know, the important stuff uh, surface up for me. And that's kind of my risk area. One of the things that I was really excited to see is that some of the, the threat intelligence companies are starting to flag techno um, companies that they know are, are, are enabling AI technologies. And I think that having some of this governance work integrated with some of the, the, the shadow IT detection and threat intelligence um, kind of reporting capabilities is fantastic because then we'll be able to flag that, hey, we found this app. Somebody, this many people are using it. 
and it has AI enablement features um, as part of its offering. So it kind of gives you kind of a narrowed down list of which ones you might want to go and ask a few questions about or those contracts you want to review and see how that uh, that data is being leveraged or used for um, operational improvement of products and services or however the, the, the language is always phrased in contract. Um, but those are, those are things that keep me up at night. I also worry a little bit about, you know, some of the data assets that I've tagged that have like provenance around consent flows and, 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 and what was an authorized processing activity getting picked up and leveraged for AI purposes, uh, because it's there and <laughs> people see it and it's data and uh, nobody's more hungry for data than an ML team inside of a company. So, um, some of the things that I, I think that we do around data discovery in, in our privacy world and tagging from a data governance perspective, um, really inform, I think, uh, understanding the risk of, of data getting leveraged for development purposes that weren't necessarily intended. So that's also exciting stuff for integrating with your privacy workflow. Absolutely. Super cool. I can add that having, uh, having those conversations between uh, data protection teams yeah. and data science teams can really help in other ways. Like, for example, I, I see a trend today that um, in many cases, data scientists run to use deep learning algorithms or LLMs because it's, it's, it's hot and it's, it's glorious and looks great. Mm -hmm. But those pose some additional, more complex risks and challenges. So I think even having that conversation about around the module and picking the right solution, imagine someone asking a data scientist, do you really need that deep learning or LLM model? Why? And if that conversation ends up with picking a simpler model, it not mm -hmm. only saves costs, but it, in many cases it works better, it requires less data, gives more accurate results and, and creates much less, much less compliance challenges. So those conversations can have indirect benefits to both sides. Honestly, the question of should we is something that actually results in better, more delightful features too. I can speak from experience with our Twitter uh, image cropping algorithm that at the end of the day, people didn't like it. <laughs> people didn't like that the computer chose what to crop in their in their image um, as it posted on a feed. And so, you know, giving people control back and, and just recognizing that human beings are in gray matter, brain matter is probably the best thing for determining what is the most important part of a picture rather than relying on ML. It turns out that was a delightful feature that people were really excited to have back. Uh, so, you know, just, just the should we question, sometimes we just get a little bit excited about our own tech, don't we, Gal? <laughs> I do. I know I do. But also sometimes we should ask the question of, is ML even the right? Is this right? Not just because it's a, a high risk process, but also is it right because it's a necessary feature? Well, yeah. we're at time. Any other questions popping in? I haven't seen any more. Just some great observations. Um, uh, we 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 have an observation from Paula that um, the e, the EU AI Act is a little bit you know legally and technically controversial. Yeah, um, I think she's right about that. You would agree. I would. I think that there's still some just you know, some decent hygiene things we can do in advance of maybe what would be a more um, globally like ready kind of framework. There's no doubt it's going to end up being a risk based framework because that's kind of what all of our regulations are turning into, which uh, kind of transfers the, the responsibility of making informed decision to a business rather than to a, a regulatory body. And uh, that, that seems to be a trend that isn't going away. So being able to identify what risks are acceptable to your business, cataloging things, that at least you have an inventory when and if these things apply. I think all of that is just good hygiene that we can we can start to take a swag at, even if we're not 100% convinced that the, the entirety of the rule um, should be applied as written. But I agree. Ah, Ingus has a question for you, Gal. Ah, your developer user slide. I'm hoping that concepts that have been around for a while, such as security and privacy by design, will be stimulated more aggressively with AI being much more visible. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, Go back yeah. to that slide. The cheapest place to make a change is always in the design phase, right? Not post post deployment. Um, so I agree with you, uh, being able to, to have these conversations much earlier in the development life cycle, uh, especially when users are, are very violently allergic to some of the outcomes, I think is going to just highlight how important it is to do reviews earlier in its life cycle. Interesting. Yeah, we've definitely seen how uh, user awareness, uh, helps to stimulate, uh, privacy. Uh, it's definitely the same with AI. 
the problem is that the users don't always understand it so uh that's a balance we always have to keep that's the challenge i guess yeah my my personal um uh vendetta on the world is to make sure that there's human feedback, structured human feedback loops for algorithm developers from the public, that there should be an opportunity for people to share their experiences and not like, hey, I thought this output was racist or I thought this output was gender biased, but literally providing useful structured feedback back to model developers so that their their lived experiences can be part of the development life cycle is a, is a personal um, uh, goal for me. And it's what my nonprofit is dedicated to as well. But uh, yes, 100% users actually know what their experiences are, even if they don't know as much about the technology. Uh, and so getting that feedback back to te technology developers, I think, is a critical part of, of making these things apply better in, in a human context. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I think that we've addressed all of the questions <laughs> and comments here. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it was very interesting. Thanks for spending time with us, everybody. I know it's the middle of your day. It's already really hard to carve out time and this is a great turnout and I'm excited to, to see some familiar names out there. Um, appreciate you all and, and good luck with all of your endeavors in ML and, and, and privacy. You have a support structure, hit us up. There's, there's, there's a group of people who, who are similarly engaged and interested. Thank you, Juta. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Gal, and thank you for the thanks for the for coming. And we hope you guys will join us for the next webinar as well.